everyone. We're just waiting a couple of minutes while everybody arrives. Great, are we ready to go, Cindy? Excellent, lovely to see you all. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for Embercoom Online. And uh, we're quite excited tonight because we're talking about a subject that's really dear to our hearts here at Embercoom, and that's rewilding. We are obviously interested in rewilding of the land, um, but one of our main interests is also in the rewilding of people. And um, I appreciate that some of us will probably be feeling a profound disconnection with the land at the moment, or others might be um, might have the opportunity of making a stronger connection with the land. But um, Perhaps this is a moment where we kind of all pause to reconsider our relationship with wildness. Um, certainly as, as, as nature flourishes in the world outside our windows. And to help us look at this subject area tonight, we're really delighted to have three people on our panel. One is Alan Watson Featherstone, who a lot of you will know, I'm sure, who really has been a pioneer of rewilding in this country. Um, he was the founder of Trees for Life, who are restoring the Caledonian forest tree by tree. I certainly done my tree planting up there and had a wonderful time many, many years ago. We have Chris Salisbury and Max Hope, who are the facilitators for our um, Where the Wild Things Are programme, which will uh, be happening next year now. We've had to reschedule that. Chris is, a, is the director of Wildwise, which is a local, um, like, I don't know what to call it, Chris, you'll, you'll take me off or whatever I say. I would say bushcraft organisation, but it's much, much more than that, so I'll let him talk about that. Max is a um, wild educator and author. Um, so again, I'll let her speak more on that. But first of all, I'd love to start with you, Alan. Um, and just really to say that uh, I came to a conference in Findhorn probably about 15, 20 years ago now called Restoring the Earth. And um, it feels like you were doing this rewilding work a long time before it caught the public's attention and I just really wanted I was just really interested to hear kind of what you make of the upsurge in interest that there's been over the last couple of years and yeah what, what's your take on rewilding at the moment? Well thanks um, Rachel and hi to Chris and Max and to everybody out there who's watching this. I can't see you all but I gather there's a big audience. So thanks for the opportunity of being part of this. Um, yes you're right, uh, rewilding as it's become known has been dear to my heart for many years. In fact uh, just last month I was in India in the community of Oroville which uh, I visited the first time in 1985 where they've restored a highly degraded desert landscape to what's called tropical dry evergreen forest. And when I was there in 1985, I got really inspired because I'd already had ideas about doing work to restore the forest in Scotland. But seeing the difficulties they'd overcome in India where they have no rain for 10 months of the year there and they had no soil left and they managed to bring nature back. It's like, yes, we can do this in Scotland. So for me, getting to the core of it, rewilding, I don't particularly like the term. Um, I prefer ecological restoration, but basically whatever term it is, is actually just human assistance for a natural process. The earth naturally is wild and 
unmanaged, self-regulating, and highly evolved over millions of years, interrelated species, habitats, ecosystems, all functioning together. And what's happened, of course, is humans have come along and severed many of the strands in the web of life. We've exterminated species, we've fragmented habitats, we've destroyed ecosystems, and we've isolated ourselves. And we live in this culture now which has this illusion that we're separate from nature, we're better than nature, we're the crown of creation. And of course, it's all false. So rewilding our ecological restoration for me is actually about stepping away from that and recognizing that we are just one strand in the web of life and how can we help that web repair itself because it has a self-repair function. Most times we are interfering with it as humans, we're preventing it from happening. In Scotland we prevent it from happening by having far too many deer and sheep on the hills that prevent any vegetation from growing. Other places it's by burning heather moorland and uh, in the tropics it's by burning forests as well. So if we stop interfering, nature will recover by herself. So rewilding for me is actually how can we subtly but catalytically stimulate and accelerate that healing process because that's what needs to happen to create a viable future for not just humans but for all life on the planet because the planet is so impoverished and depleted now and so many populations have been pushed to the cliff edge. Um, the time is now and I think it's really interesting uh, right now today in this moment in 2020 where human civilization has had the pause button pushed by this tiny little virus that we call COVID-19 that we can't see with the naked eye, uh, but it's brought the whole juggernaut to a temporary pause and it's giving us time to reflect and hopefully to make a major course correction. So it's a very exciting time. You know, there's lots of people have been doing pioneering work I mentioned Oroville in India, there's the work I've done with Trees for Life, there's people restoring ecosystems all over the planet, so we, we know how to do it now, and now is the time where it has to become a massive large-scale event. The conference you mentioned that you came to restore the earth, you know, was part of my big vision that the 21st century will become known as the century of restoring the earth. And I spent a couple of years trying to get the UN to make a declaration of the century of restoring the earth. It didn't happen. We made the declaration at the conference, as you probably remember, on the final mm. section. But look what's happened now. We've now got a decade of ecological restoration declared by the UN. It's not a century, but it's coming soon in 2021. It's a decade. It's time to really focus. So we've got this moment. We've got this opportunity. And I think it's really... Um, mandatory for all of us to step up, you know, to step up to the mark, increase our game and make the most of the opportunity that's there. Fantastic. Do you think that, well, two questions kind of occur to me from that. The first one is, do you think this kind of humans being isolated in their, in their, I want to say cages, that's what I mean, sometimes that's how it feels, but us being isolated a lot of us away from the land will make a will make any kind of a difference here and also my second question would be uh what could we all do you know if we've got 2021 coming what what can we all do just kind of on, on our own patches of land well taking the first part of your question first i think it's a really interesting situation um i'm fortunate that i live out um, on the edge of the Finhorn community and right outside my door I've got fields, I've got a woodland and the sea is about 400 metres away. So I can go for a walk in nature every day, um, which many people with an urban environment don't have the same opportunity. I'm suffering because I can't go to the Caledonian forest to Glen Affric, where I usually go every week. I haven't been there for two and a half months now, so I'm deprived by that. But what it is doing is enabling me to spend a lot more time in my local area. And one day last week, for example, on one of my daily walks, I stopped with some pine trees. There's lots of young Scots pines. And I was looking at them and there's these tiny little orange blobs on the needles. It's a fungus. Um, it's a rust fungus. And most people probably don't even see them. With a hand lens, they look interesting. With high magnification macro equipment, they're stunningly beautiful. I put pictures up on um, Twitter and somebody said aliens because it looked like this spectacular alien life form. So there's all sorts of things to discover locally. 
I had an email exchange with George Monbiot the other day, and he said his nature explorations are confined to the soil in his garden now, but he's discovering the wonders of soil, microorganisms, and the whole world that's there, which is the foundation of all biological life on land on the planet. So I think it's really important to recognize that rewilding and connecting with nature is not just the big scale going to the top of a mountain or going to a rainforest or something like that. Nature is all around us. And even in a city, you know, there'll be grass growing up between the cracks of the paving stones or a tree in the street. Uh, there might be aphids feeding on the tree. You know, there's lots of things to explore. And that's really getting to the heart of what needs to happen for uh, the world to change. We have to reconnect with nature, in my view, in a deep way, in a meaningful way. I say to people these days, I feel like I grew up as a deprived person. And if I look at myself, I'd grown up in Scotland. My parents weren't rich, but they weren't poor. I was never lacking for anything on a physical level. I have a healthy body, a good education. But what I was deprived of was daily connection with wild nature. And most people grow up deprived of that today. And because of that deprivation, we've created a culture which does not see or understand or recognize the impact it's having on the rest of nature. So it's re-establishing that personal connection. And I think the lockdown, to come to the second part of your question, is providing people with, oh my God, I'm really missing, you know, getting out into a forest, walking along a river or going to the beach or climbing in the mountains or whatever it is. And I think the, the circumstances we're in are pairing back all the complexity of life that we've created with all the stimuli to what's really important. What are the essentials? Human contact, love for one another, and deep connection with nature. So I think it's difficult for some people, but there's a real, there's a real nug, nugget of learning to come out of this, which is essential. I've been saying to people, um, you know, there's a lot of interest now in indigenous peoples around the world and their wisdom and how so many of their cultures are threatened. But actually, if you think about it, yeah, when I think about it, we're all indigenous people. We're all indigenous to planet Earth. It's just that most of us don't act as indigenous anymore because we don't have a sense of place, a sense of connectedness. We don't have a little bit of nature, most of us, that we love every day, that we follow through the seasons that we care for that we steward and okay. that is the separation and we've got to create a culture in which we all become indigenous in that way it doesn't mean going back to living as hunter-gatherers but it means connecting deeply with nature where we are loving that and helping that recover and bringing it back to life and abundance again and that to me is getting to the heart of what rewilding is about and it's that also is what rewilding the human is about too then because it's re-establishing that intimate personal connection fantastic alan and i think that really uh, mirrors the, the work that we do at embercombe as well in in trying to foster that connection between we as humans and kind of wildness around us i'd like to bring in chris and max now um Chris, you, well, I will let you introduce yourself, but um, you've worked with a lot of people kind of on this rewilding, the human rewilding, the soul. Um, stuff. You've, you've just come back from Namib Namibia as well, and I'd love you to say something, a little something about that too, but what's your take on rewilding the human? Oh, it's such a big question, Rachel. Yeah, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Before I sort of get stuck into that, <clears throat> go off on one. Um, I'm just, um, I just want to send greetings to everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this strange medium, which I'm still getting used to. But I send you greetings from a wild and uh, windy and wet West Country, where I'm sitting with this little weather change we're having right now. So a whole mixture of rain and blossoms in the air, fragrance and birdsong. I've got a few grains of sand from the Kalahari still in my system. I just got back um, just before lockdown, just in time. Having spent some time out with the Bushmen out there in a conservancy that is truly a wild place in the way that much of our beloved land here is no longer a wild place, which isn't to say there isn't music to listen to of, of 
of the wild things, as Alan has been eloquently saying, growing up between the cracks and, um, you know, in the parking um, car parks and, you know, everywhere, really, when your eye and ear and heart is attuned. So there's lots to encourage us. Um, there's lots of messages of hope all around us. It's about a literacy, I suppose, and a language um, uh, of understanding. And I think we do need to um, take a step towards the natural world for us to receive that blessing and that, that message. And whilst we can get, you know, nature connected in all sorts of ways, and I suspect that everybody here is, uh, is indeed, um, you know, practicing all sorts of um, getting acquainted with the natural world. I hope so in whatever way they can in this period. And generally, I think there's a deeper invitation <clears throat> that we're being offered at the moment. Um, you know, the natural world is endlessly sending us invitations, you know, albeit a rainbow, a rainstorm, you know, um, a blossom, um, you know, a thrush's song. And, you know, we're so distracted, of course, um, because we're so sort of busy and diverted that we rarely spend time, you know, listening. So, um, but beyond our usual, you know, nature connection fix, I think probably what this time is offering us is something deeper um, and asking for something bolder and braver from us. We're all getting recalibrated. Everything's under review, isn't it? It's um, it's a really curious and interesting time. Feels like in that old Vision Quest model, a bit of severance is going on, and the threshold that we're on, or on the edge of, um, is begging us, you know, to step over and more purposefully and consciously and carefully back out into the world. But really, the <clears throat> the message from me is someone who's been standing on that threshold and beckoning and persuading people to sort of come and make acquaintance you know of the wild world um you know that is is ever more urgent right now and i think we've got to find ways of um, breaking our own habits you know and patterns even of our nature connection just to go in deeper uh so that's been my my work i suppose because i was also in a, in a different rewilding context, wasn't called that then, but I worked for Dead Wildlife Trust for many years as education officer. And of course, you know, those organizations have been doing all of that incredible rewilding work. And now this thing has come along and it's very helpful in a way, this term of reference, rewilding, and, um, and we're all kind of getting exercised by it and um, provoked by it and excited by it. So um, it's so confusing and such a big subject. And I, I know we don't have time to go into it all, um, but I'm just delighted that Max showed up um, uh, at the right time in the right place here in Devon. And um, we've curated this incredible programme up at Embercombe to just start to kind of uh, yeah, visit some of those questions and, and marinate in some of the wildness on our journey around the UK um, to visit some of these pioneering sites, one of which is Alan's uh, site up in Scotland, for example, where we can ask each other these sort of humbling um, and provocative questions and see in a thrilling, unknown, unpredictable way what we will be on the other side. Uh, so it's, a, it's our own threshold that we're proposing for next year at Embercombe. I think I'll just piggyback on the back of that, Chris, if that's okay. So I also want to say hello to everybody from uh, Dartmoor. Um, my own personal journey brought me here um, to live uh, a year ago today, funnily enough. So it's really lovely to, to be on the screen now talking to you a bit about rewilding. Um, and I'm particularly interested about what it means for people to, to be rewilded or to be on a rewilding journey. Um, so there's a lot of research that being in nature and being outdoors is good for people, in, in, especially in terms of mental and physical health. Um, and therefore, if we're rewilding people, are we just talking about nature connection, about camping and making fires and looking for wildlife? Well, for me, I think it's so much more than that, because Alan's phrase just earlier in this conversation is that Earth naturally is wild and self-regulating. Um, and for me, I'd like to frame it as well, that human beings are naturally wild and self-regulating. But the society in which we live means that that is not always the state that we inhabit our, our lives. So if rewilding is about going back to a more natural state where nature has taken its own course and humans are not controlling and managing every, everything, 
then we apply that to human beings and it requires a lot of letting go and a lot of unlearning and it requires challenging cultural and social expectations and it requires taking apart a lot of what we believe. Um, it means that humans have to connect deeply to themselves and to each other and to the natural world and they have to tune into themselves and tune out from other dominant messages and voices. Um, and this is challenging and discombobulating and unsettling. Um, and it can demand a severance or separation from really, you know, strong and personal ideas and imaginings or people even that we've held dear. And this is hard work. Um, I'm so excited that next year, Chris and I will be, be working together with Alan and Rachel at Embercombe to put on this year long adventure in rewilding. That's what we're calling it. It's called Where the Wild Things Are and Adventure in Rewilding. And it will be so exciting to go to some really wild places in the UK from Cornwall and Devon right up to Scotland um, and to try and have an adventure in, in rewilding ourselves within places that are also being rewilded. So I'd love to, you know, see some of you on that journey with us. Um, but it's really lovely to be here uh, talking about it now. Great, thanks, Max. Maybe I could come back to you, Alan. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? I think a question that I had is kind of, you know, in a few weeks' time, we'll kind of be able to be freer. You'll be able to go back to the Caledonian Forest. We'll all, all be able to go to the places, hopefully, that that that, that we love so well. What 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 can we all do at that moment? What what what? What would be your advice for us at that moment? Okay, that's an interesting question. I haven't given much thought to that. I think I live more in the moment. <laughs> so, and I don't know when that release is going to come. Um, but in this moment, my answer to it would be is, I think we need to make sure that we do not go back to life as it was before. That's the most crucial thing. We need to take whatever we've learned from this time of pause, the time of lockdown, the time of being at home, and use that to make changes in our lives. Because as um, Max and Chris were saying, rewilding, for it to be successful in the world, it's not just about you know planting trees or reintroducing beavers. Fundamental to the success of all those efforts is going to be scaling back the impact of the culture we've created on the planet. Um, because at the moment, one species, Homo sapiens, consumes about 50% of the Earth's primary biological productivity. And all the other species have to make do with the other 50%. And of course, all our cultures, every country in the world is still on the same trajectory of endless economic growth, meaning that the destination we're heading to is taking more and more of the planet for ourselves. So that's what has to change. And that has to happen at different levels. It has to happen at a policy level, at a government level, but it also has to happen at an individual level. And I would like to hope that each one of us makes some choices, even if they're small, simple ones, to bring our daily lives more in alignment with asking less of the earth. You know, and many people do that already. You know, there's a big movement for people to become vegan in this country because uh, people realize, A, that animals are mistreated and B, that a plant-based diet needs about 10% of the Earth's land area to provide the food that an animal-based diet does. Um, it means using public transport instead of private cars and all the other things. So I would like to think that we take this time of re-emergence when it happens in a month's time or whenever it is to actually say, it's a bit like a new year's res resolution. I'm going to make whatever change it is that feels right for me at this time. One thing I think that's really important um, and I think a lot of people are doing it already is connecting more with food because that's one of the basic things. And you know, when the lockdown started, of course, there was this panic buying and you know, things got, you know, shelves got emptied and so forth. People are realizing you need food 
So, um, and I know that seed companies have been experiencing a massive um, purchase rush for seeds for people to grow things. And I would encourage everybody to grow some food for themselves. And if you've got a garden, that's great. If you don't have a garden, you can still grow food. I have a garden, fortunately, but in the winter here in Scotland, where it's dark and cold and things won't grow outside, I still grow food inside. I grow sprouts every day of the year in jars in my kitchen, and I eat the food that I grow with my own lungs. And that is part of how I reconnect with nature on a daily basis. And then, you know, I, I, cut, I trimmed my beard today so I would look a bit tidy for this. You know, and I cut my nails the other day. All those go in a little container in my bathroom. And then once every week or so, I empty those into my compost heap. And it's a very conscious process of me reconnecting with nature. I eat the food that I grow potatoes from the garden, sprouts from my kitchen, tomatoes from my conservatory, and then the bits of me, the cells and parts of me that uh, have finished their useful purpose, nail clippings, hair, go into the compost and they get recycled into the garden. Now that may sound, sound like a, a little trite thing to do, but it's actually very powerful and anybody can do that. So that's, that's one thing I'd suggest is that we become more conscious of our relationship with food when I first came to live at Findhorn 40 years ago, I was the community baker. And I used to bake 100 loaves a day, four days a week for the community. And I hadn't baked bread for probably 30 years until the lockdown started. And because bread wasn't so readily available, I thought, I'm going to start baking bread again. And it's really a wonderful thing to do because bread is working with, it's called the staff of life. It's yeast, which is a, a fungal organism, which is alive. And it's putting love into that too. So it's about giving love back to nature. How can we do that in new ways? How can we appreciate something in our garden, plants we grow, the tree outside on the street, the birds, the pigeons that you see in the city streets? You know, how can we find new ways to give love to those? Because that is part of what reconnects us with nature. And it's part of this giving back. Fantastic. I've got, I've got a great question here from Kelly. Um... Alan. Okay. Um, she's saying that she's really interested to hear how we galvanize as communities. So we've talked very much about the individual. How, how do we as a collective do more here? Um, how can we do more to galvanize communities of people to work together? Yes. Yeah. Or to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most important thing is the power of a positive example. I think many people now, perhaps most people are aware radical change is needed. We can't go on the way we've been heading. You know, we've had a number of wake up calls, um, you know, with the whole issue of climate change. And now the virus is, is the, the latest one. And um, I think people respond to positivity. You know, there's a lot of fear in the world today and people are searching for hope. They're searching for some good news. They're searching for something that is a viable alternative. And that to me has always been the most powerful message of Trees for Life, that people could come um, like um, yourself, like Chris came and engage, plant a tree, um, share a week together with other people as you're doing at Embercombe as well where you get a, a creative exchange of ideas and we all realize that we're not alone we're in it together we can learn from each other and there's a creative synergy that happens Findhorn is based on the principle that two plus two is more than four it's more than five even when we come together and share the, the spirit share the love of our hearts that becomes attractive and magnetic and it touches and inspires other people and when I travel um, I tend to go to places where people are doing that. I was in India in Oroville, which is a similar community. And it's deeply moving and inspiring for me every time I've been there, four times now, uh, to see what they're doing. And I think that gives me strength and passion to keep going myself. It becomes a mutually reinforcing positive circle instead of the vicious circles that we see of spiraling down in doom and gloom. So find right. ways to work, to work with your neighbours, to work with people locally. I think the great thing about this um, uh, lockdown too is that it's opened up all these channels of interacting electronically like this, you know, uh, on a way that perhaps the founders of Zoom and Skype never imagined, you know, happening so quickly. So there are ways to really connect and support one another to exchange ideas and information and to really, you know, 
get the knowledge that we need to make the changes that are required now. Fantastic. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm just uh, looking at the questions that we're getting coming up on the chat here. And I've got another great question from Katrina. Uh, maybe I could ask this one to Max, because I know you've worked with a lot of, kind of children's education, Max. Katrina's asking and or set, noticing that, you know, children are questioning the role of humans within the web of life. You know, why are humans here? What's our point? If we're making such a negative impact, wouldn't nature be happier without us? Have you got anything, anything to say on that? Funnily enough, I was just about to start answering that question in the chat. So thanks oh, for that. you. Um, I think it's a, a fantastic question, which, which um, helps us to illustrate how we have to see humans as part of the ecosystem and not separate from it. And I think that one of the the issues that we have is that within society we often believe ourselves to be separate from or above nature and we tell children that you know uh, they are separate from nature and I think part of rewilding and rewilding children which is a real passion of mine of how to rewild children or how to rewild education is around helping children to see that they are part of an interconnected ecosystem um, and that although you know they there is a good argument of why they may say that actually nature does better without us that we have to find a way of um, of helping all of us to see that actually we are part of it and that we need to um, you know we interact with nature we have an impact on it it has an impact on us um, so I think for me that's that's where we have to begin is around is around how we all interconnect. Have you got anything to add to that, Chris? Uh, yeah, I've got plenty. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, very directly, I think explaining through, um, you know, terms and words and trying to help a child understand something like that is only can go so far. I think we have to um, take them by the hand and we have to, lead them to the wild things, um, take them to the places where the wild things are, and that can be a garden, it can be a park, it can be literally whatever is growing or flying around the neighbourhood. And we, by holding their hand, you know, the child sort of has a sort of double impact. You know, there's all sorts of studies um, um, that have been done on the effect of the natural world on children and how much it is ramped up when uh, an adult is with them and sharing in the discovery and the delight. So we have to model that for our children and we have to give them immersive experiences in the natural world. Many of those need to be them playing by themselves, you know, unstructured time. Uh, and that's the, probably the golden um, ticket for a child is to have some free play in some, you know, natural places for them to discover the affinity in, and the kinship that's the foundation that's what i'm key enough to have and my god it was just pure luck there was no parent or adult who took me down to the forest but i just happened to be able to walk there by myself so i spent endless hours messing about in the woods how fortunate was i but it put a foundation uh, in place you see i made those discoveries and i had those feelings you know and wonder and awe would happen and uh and that's the basis for it, I believe. So we have to reintroduce the child to the natural world and the joy of it, um, the flavour of it, um, by immersive activity. And there's so many people doing that. Forest School is a recent development, for example. It's viral, it's spreading. And then the last thing I want to say is we have to cultivate that for ourselves. <clears throat> and I want to sort of put in for a bit more social distancing here, just to be a little bit uh, provocative. Um, by which I mean, you know, culturally, we have this habit of being very obsessed with ourselves, being extremely social animals, nothing wrong with that, but it's just, it's just an overdose. Um, I think when we take ourselves over our own thresholds and spend some time out alone in the natural world, other things can happen. We pay attention very differently when we're on our own. Our ears can attune if we're consciously stepping over that threshold and really stepping out in humility and listening right now after in lockdown and after lockdown whatever that looks like right now we're going to be able to hear 
um, things we've never heard before. People are already reporting, aren't they? Oh, there are more birds around. Well, no, there's less traffic and you're just spending more time and you're noticing more. But now's the time, um, sort of mythically speaking, to hear that bell tolling, the one that will awake the inner sovereign. In the old stories, it's uh, King Arthur or the once and future king who's buried beneath the earth, waiting for a time when that bell is tolling. Well, I think it's time for our own sovereignty. And if we're willing, and we're willing to listen and put our ear to the ground, we'll hear it tolling for ourselves and we'll begin to wake up that inner sovereign and take action in the ways that we need to. And, um, wow. That's given me goose pimples. Um, I just saw a lovely point there um, on the children front. You know, actually what we're talking about here, rewilding ecological restoration is a way of demonstrating that humans can ha have a positive impact, you know, as, as guardians, stewards, you know, m maybe it's not all negative. Um, so that was a good point. Um, I think I will open the floor to live questions then if I may. If our technology allows us, um, if you could put your hand up digitally, if you know how to do that, um, if you don't, just wave it, and Cindy, our host tonight, will have a look through and unmute you. So, if 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 she calls your name and you're unmuted, if you could just say who you're asking your question to, and then ask it, that would be brilliant. And if anybody wants to send it on the chat as well, I've got an eye on the chat too. I can see Jan's got one from here. Jan? Hello, yeah. Hi, I'm Jan from the Netherlands. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And nice to hear you. Super inspiring. My first time at Abercom. I live in the Netherlands and I was wondering, I'm very engaged. Or I'm very interested in permaculture. How do you how do you see the permaculture movement also as being part of rewilding uh, nature? So you see this as something more as a movement together, or is it separate, a separate thing? Or I'm curious about what your uh, point, uh, your view is on this. Great, thanks, John. So that's a question to Alan. Um, I think for Alan. Alan. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, it was a bit hard to understand. You were a bit garbled coming across, but I think I got the gist of it. So I think um, rewilding and permaculture are very complementary with a fair amount of overlap. Um, for me, I tend to come from more of a purist uh, ecological restoration background. So my interest in the work that I've been involved with for over 30 years is about restoring a natural ecosystem that is there for the rest of nature. So I picked an area deliberately in the Highlands of Scotland where there's very few people living, where there's no roads, very remote, uh, so that it's a place where a big forest could grow and ideally eventually all the missing wildlife could come back. And it would be there just for nature, it wouldn't be there for people to exploit, although people could go there. Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum then about creating sustainable human livelihoods that are in balance with nature is what permaculture is all about. And permaculture has uh, a zonation system in which uh, I think it's zone five is the wild area. So that's where they meet. And we need both of those things. So I see them as, as complementary with an overlap. And um, the, same, the principle of both is the same actually, because rewilding is all about having human humility and saying nature knows best, let's let nature do what nature wants to do. And permaculture then is about designing human systems that mimic natural processes. And I, I wrote a series of principles of ecological restoration to guide the work of Trees for Life. And the underlying premise of them all is nature knows best and mimic nature wherever possible. And that's, that could come straight out of permaculture. So I hope that answers you. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks Alan. Does anybody else have a question? Alice, 
You can unmute yourself, yeah. Brilliant. Hello. Um, I think my question is probably for Max. Um, do you have any tips on rewilding teenagers? Mm. Or teenage boys in particular? <laughs> I've got so much to say about that, so I'm going to really try and limit it. So I think that there is so much unlearning that needs to happen for teenagers because they have spent their whole lives from the minute they're born being that sometimes gently, sometimes more harshly kind of controlled and channeled to behave in certain ways and to be expected to, um, to have particular aspirations or to relate to people in particular ways or whatever. And I think that part of what we need to do with rewilding is to support children and young people to, um, to find their wild child and to find their wild self and to, and to re-engage with, with what their innate feelings and senses are. And that is actually quite difficult. And there's, there's often anxiety around that, which is, oh God, well, if we let teenage boys find their wild selves, we, we'll be Lord of the Flies and it will be crazy. Um, but, but actually, I just don't think that that's true. And our experience, you know, through research and pr as practitioners of working with teenagers or working, you know, with boys is not that they turn into kind of crazy, wild creatures, but that actually they can find something really quite deep within themselves. Um, and that, you know, there, there are such there are such important outcomes that come from that. Um, so I'm I'm a big fan of deep immersive wilderness experiences, whether that's kind of overnight solos, fire quests, vision quests. Um, so that's kind of a, a quite extreme version. Um, Wild Wise run a wonderful camp called the Hunger Games, which is young people running around in the woods with Nerf guns, having just the most amazing nature connection experiences, um, as well as shooting each other. So, you know, I think there's loads of wonderful ways of doing it and it can start small. It can start with building campfires and whittling and it can become much, much bigger. But for me, it has to start with a trust, a deep trust that young people can actually um, go into nature and can feel something and don't need to be con constantly controlled and told what to do and told off. That's all I'll say for now, but I have got a lot more. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Alice, for the question. Anybody else with a question? I've got a sign saying, Jerry, somebody has got their hand up. Aha. Uh -huh. Jerry, would you like to unmute? Yeah, I, I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, greetings from Hawaii, everyone. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I stumbled upon all of you, and it's it's really great to have some some kindred spirits that far away. Um, I really believe in everything you're doing that I've learned about so far from your website and from a couple of these uh, calls. And what's coming up for me is um, I'm interested in connecting more with my ancestry. Um, I've always connected more with wild nature where I am. I grew up in New York. I've spent time in the Amazon and in Central America in the last decade here in Hawaii. But my ancestry comes from Europe and England. And um, so, yeah, I was excited when I found out that you folks are, like I said, kindred spirits in England. And I'm just wondering what you would say for someone who's living in a different part of the world, but also feels this, this call to connect with ancestry, uh, kind of my, my pagan indigenous roots from um, England, where would you direct someone to begin to go to learn more, any books or references, anything that comes to mind? I'm just curious about that. Wow, that feels like a big question. Um, we are very interested um, at Ember uh, about this whole idea that Alan was talking about, about this becoming indigenous. You know, how do we all become indigenous to planet Earth? 
Um, I think that's a lot about kind of what we feel our ancestry is, kind of uh, as humans, but also as in the wider than human world. Um, and we could talk a lot about this subject, and I, I'll ask Alan to maybe say a few words about that as well. But uh, we have a we have a program called Contemporary Animism, which kind of deals with some of the things that you're asking about. Um, I know that Schumacher College as well do some of this work too. So, so yes, it, it, it would be lovely to talk more, Jerry. Um, yeah, Schumacher College and Emberkin, to take a look at some other things that we're doing. Alan, do you want to add any more to that? Uh, I would just say two things to Jerry um, on two different levels. One is on a very practical level, there's lots of organizations, websites and so forth that help with genealogy, you know, that you can help trace back maybe where um, if you've got, you know, some records of great grandparents and previous generations where they came from. Um, so that, that's one route to follow. The other one I would say is that's kind of the intellectual version. The other one is much more an intuitive one. If you've got a feeling about, you know, uh, you want to explore that, then do it, you know, come to Europe. And if you've got a particular draw to some place, go there and see what it feels like. Uh, you mentioned going to the Amazon and Central America. I've, I've spent about three years of my life in South America because I feel very connected there. And um, I've been all over the continent. Most recently, I've been to the, the Araucaria forests of the Andes in Chile and Argentina and working on a book project there. And that was following my intuition. And the forest really spoke to me like the Caledonian forest does here in Scotland. And I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't think my family has any history there, but there's a connection. And when I feed that connection, when I put some energy into it, um, doors open, avenues um, become apparent, and there's a, a path that I can follow. And I would offer that to you as well. If you feel strongly about this, you know, find a way to come to Europe and to see where your path leads you. Also, you. Jer also Jerry, just to say in the chat, um, people are making some great suggestions here. Um, for example, there's a documentary called The Time of the Sixth Sun, which is really good. Um, have a look at what people are saying there. Um, let me see, what else have we got? Here's a question. Um, how do we go from re-engaging with our phonetic daily life to slowing down and honouring the earth? Um, how do we honour our own and each other's sovereignty? <laughs> sovereignty. I think this is kind of a question that we're all going to be asking ourselves, having found this pause, how do we kind of keep this feeling when we re-emerge from this? Um, I wonder, Chris, if you have any thoughts on that? Um, I have many thoughts on that. It's, um, it can feel a bit like swimming upstream to change our habits, you know, what we've become habituated to, what everyone else is doing to to swim upstream and decline the social invitation to um, spend the day out wandering instead or traveling somewhere that is not the human world and pay attention to the non-human or the more than human world. Um, it can feel very um, counterculture, I suppose, um, but it is nevertheless, it's a habit that you're gonna need to begin to cultivate and start in small ways. Don't uh, start off necessarily with having to, you know, design a great, huge, big wilderness experience, but um, just create some small, rhythmical, deliberate habits of stepping out Perhaps you'll decide not to speak, you know, for a certain number of hours and only listen. Um, or you'll just try some different things by stopping, perhaps not always walking, just sitting and being, challenging yourself for um, whatever comes up, <clears throat> noticing what surfaces from within. You might find that, you know, voices, you know, um, are, are heard that you don't normally hear inside yourself or you might find a kind of meditation in it that just makes your whole being feel better. But some deliberate acts to change habits and just spend some time with the natural world, whatever that looks like in your, in your region. Um, easy steps, baby steps maybe to begin with, but it's about 
habit, changing habit, putting in some practice, like anything, you know, we don't expect, you know, to be able to pick up a musical instrument and just play it beautifully straight away. We have to put in some hard yards. Hopefully, spending time in nature isn't hard yards, but it does mean swimming up stream a little bit and creating that time that's the foundation of a lot of the work i do in the year programs we teach at worldwise it's in all the programs we teach with the kids uh it's about getting out and just stopping and we call it the sit spot practice it's, but it can you can build up from five minutes up to just a regular little half an hour spots in some place doesn't have to be wilderness you know it can be um you know on the edge of a park or somewhere and just start paying attention and that is one of the ways to wake up you know, your indigenous soul. Believe me, it's a very simple, but very, very profound practice. Um, God, I could go on with this subject, it's so interesting, but um, back to you, Rachel, there's probably more other questions. Fantastic. And just to say that I thought what Alan was saying um, about becoming more acquainted with our local area is a good one um, on that too. Um, he would probably, uh, we're down to our last couple of questions, we've only got nine minutes left, but here is a good one that's come up in the chat, me, Nusha, thanks for sending this to me, is engaging in rewilding a privilege of the wealthy in the West, how can people struggling to feed their family and taking jobs in, in industrial and capitalist systems be involved? Alan. Well, that's a great question. I saw it there myself and I was thinking about it. Um, I think the answer to that is twofold. In some ways, it is easier for people who are comfortable in the West, like I am. You know, I don't have to struggle to uh, know where my next meal is coming from. I don't have to walk 10 miles a day to get water to drink. Um, I've got you know, technology and transport at my disposal so I can go to Glen Affric and plant trees. Um, However, I've traveled a lot and there are people all over the world, including very poor areas who are engaging in this as well, because it is more immediate in their face in many places that they, they need to take care of their local environment um, in order to survive. Uh, I mentioned already, I've been to Oroville. So Oroville is a community uh, founded um, on the teachings of a, a woman called the mother, who was the partner of Sri Aurobindo. And they got some of the desertified land in Tamil Nadu in India. And they started planting trees and building earth mounds around the contours called buns to stop the rain, uh, washing away all the soil into canyons in the monsoon. And they employed some of the local villagers, the Tamil villagers to do this. And these villagers were living at a subsistence level, but they saw very quickly the results of what the Aurovillians were doing, that trees were able to grow, they produced shade, birds came and life returned. So they started doing the same thing. And those are very poor people. So it's, it's perhaps easier for those of us who are more comfortable in the West, but actually I've seen restoration projects in many parts of the world in so-called poor countries. And there's now an organization which I'm involved with called Ecosystem Restoration Camps, um, which I'm part of an online course that's launching on May the 15th. Sorry to plug something else here. Um, but those camps are being set up all over the world, including many poor countries where people can go and volunteer and bring their skills and their abilities and their knowledge um, to help re-establish you know, healthy ecosystems on different parts of the planet. So I really see this becoming, going back to the theme of restoring the earth, becoming the first shared task for all humanity. And at this time when a lot of financial decisions are coming up for um, being made when we come out of lockdown, you know, there's a lot of talk about we've got to redirect funds away from climate destroying things. I think we also need to really be conscious about redirecting our support to poor countries towards projects that help restore those lands. Because that is the long term future. Um, if I quote Vandana Shiva, some of you I'm sure are very well aware of her work. Uh, she's very eloquently said, we need to move from a culture which is based on oil to one which is based on soil. Because soil is what grows our food and what supports all life. And we need to be redirecting all of our support towards that, I believe. Fantastic. Thanks, Alan. And somebody's making a very good point here that it's not just overseas, but in our country as well, that, that 
kind of we need to consider these things too. Um, I think that we will leave it there for now. Um, just a few things to say at the end. Um, I was going to also talk about eco restoration camps, Alan. So thank you for bringing that up because Ember Plume has become the first UK eco restoration camp. So we kind of have enjoyed that. Uh, we have joined that international network of camps that are trying to make these restoration projects as accessible to people as we can from a diversity of backgrounds. So um, we'll be making announcements about that in the coming week. Um, also to say, if you've enjoyed this, then we are collecting bursary funds for people to attend experiences, courses, retreats at Ambercombe and money goes towards helping people that that you know can't find the these to come so that that allows more people to come to us um really big thank you to alan and to chris and max for talking tonight uh thank you to all of you for coming for staying for asking questions for getting involved thank you to cindy and nusha as ever for being our beautiful typical hosts and we look forward to seeing you if you're up for it, we have a Beltane celebration on Friday at 1 p.m. with Max. Um, we're asking people to bring their own candle if they can, and also a spring headdress if they feel up for it. But yes, we hope to see you again and have a wonderful evening and lots of love. Bye bye.